Hey guys, I'm Zachary Gordon, and you are watching The Permanent Rain Press. Hi everyone, it's Chloe with The Permanent Rain Press, and today I am very happy to be joined by Zachary Gordon. How's it going? Um, it's going well. I'm uh, currently in my living room, and obviously I'm in California. You're in, in British Columbia, so uh, technology is pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Tell me, how are you and your family holding up and keeping busy during this time? So we're all good. I'm I'm currently um, hanging out with my parents during all this. It's been nice. It's it's there's been I think in the beginning it was it was difficult at times. I mean, we were clashing occasionally, and and now I think we're we're creatures of habit. So I've gotten into the routine, and they do their thing, and um, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to, I don't want to complain about it because clearly it's, we're all trying to figure it out in our own way, but you have to deal with it. And I think I'm now in a place where I, I hate to say that it's become the new, the new normal. So I'm not worried about it. I'm not second guessing it as much, but I'm doing well. My family's doing well. I think a big shock where this all became very real to me was my grandmother passed away a few weeks ago and we couldn't attend the funeral and it had to be over Zoom. And I think I had a new whole perspective of all this, just the fact that I'm not alone. We're all going through this and we're all have, having to deal with our own unique set of, of circumstances and, and we're all in this together. So it's, it's been humbling. It's also been inspiring and um, I've become very introspective um, throughout the last couple of months, but everyone's healthy that I'm connected to, and that's really all that matters. So we are going to talk about a film you have in post-production, you have a lot you've been working on um, over the years, but this one's called Dreamcatcher. Tell me a bit about it and you know what your experience was on set. So Dreamcatcher is um, a film directed by um, Jacob Johnston, and I, you know what's fun about this is I actually like to talk about the audition process because I think a lot of people, maybe in my situation or in other actor situations, might think that you just sort of get a script and you go. I mean, I auditioned for it. I met with the director in the room, and I think there's something to be said about this this unspoken chemistry based off of us being very passionate about the project that he wrote because the director, Jacob, also wrote it and directed it. That being said... Um, he's an up-and-coming filmmaker, um, and we immediately meshed, and I think that we had a similar vision for the movie. I loved my character. Now, I'm going off on a tangent about before I even get into the movie. So the movie, um, I don't want to butcher the log line, but it's pretty much a bunch of, uh, of teenagers slash um, young adults. Um, I'm actually not sure what I can and can't say, but... Um, it's, it's, it's a semi-horror film. Um, it's almost like, if you guys have heard of the movie, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Wait, is that a movie? I Know What You Did Last Summer. That's the one with, uh, I just want to make sure I'm getting that right, with Ryan Felipe, right? Um, yeah, so it's a cross between that and, and it's sexy, it's fun, it's, it's scary. And um, it's like a modern day version of that. Um, again, I don't want any of the filmmakers to, to get upset with me. But um, that being said, it was a, a super interesting experience. I had never worked on a project with actually a first time director. And I think I was nervous, but like I was saying, the fact that him and I agreed on a similar vision for what we wanted for the project and you have to put your trust in him and, and hopefully put his trust in me, which I, I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, that was our experience while we filmed the movie. And, and I like to think the movie turned out well and hopefully when people tune in, they'll, uh, they'll agree. It was announced that it was, it's about a stalker assailant at an underground music festival. So that news is already out there. You'll be starring right. as Jake. Uh, so you mentioned Jacob Johnston, you know, you meshed really well with him. Uh, I think he did visual development for some of the Marvel superhero movies. So I'm really excited to see what he does with this one. Talented young ensemble, aside from yourself, um, Nikki, Olivia, Travis, Blaine. I'm assuming you had a lot of fun together when the cameras weren't rolling. I'll tell you what, I still, I mean, I still talk with the majority of them weekly. I, I saw from a social distance, um, I saw Nikki and Elizabeth and, um, and Emrys, Emrys, uh, Emrys uh, Cooper. I don't want to, um, mem I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to make sure I'm saying everything correct. Um, but they're, they were tremendous. I mean, 
when you go on to a, a, a smaller budget and you work on an independent film, I think a lot of people have their reservations. They're nervous whether the film's going to turn out well, and it's a business. So you try to get the best actors you possibly can, and, and I think it, it was a crime how much fun we had. And I truly mean that. I, I think that with a scary horror film, you have to be intense, you have to sell the story, and you have to make sure you believe the circumstances that you're in. So hopefully in turn, people can also go along on the, on the journey with you. And I, and I think that it's, it's interesting to watch the film and, and look back when I watch a film that I'm in, I, I tend to think of the memories more than the story itself. And, and every scene I watched when I saw the film, I, I couldn't help but remember all the times where we were cracking jokes before someone gets hurt or something terrible happens. And I think that goes to show you that when you have a group of actors that trust the craft and trust the work that they've done, they're able to let loose. And really, you know, why else be an actor? If Yes, you're passionate about the art. I am too. But if you're not having fun, you know, then what's the point? Because, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm most passionate about is, is meeting great actors, like you were saying, Nikki, Elizabeth, Blaine, um, Blaine Kern, I think the third. Um, Blaine and I got very close. He's a character in the film as well. And um, just a tremendous ensemble, as you were saying. I mean, it was one of my favorite films I've ever worked on. And I think it's because of the limiting budget and all of us just sort of jumping on board, not because we were driven by the monetary aspect. Clearly, we couldn't be. It was because we were passionate about the movie and the script and working with Jacob and, and you know, getting better at what we all love to do, which is acting. And you've mentioned before, no trailers, so you all kind of hung out on a single party bus. And, you know, like you mentioned, really taking the time to cultivate and build those relationships and then watch that play out on screen. You know, lastly, why should viewers tune in? What are you most excited for them to see from Dreamcatcher? So one thing I do want to touch on quickly that you mentioned, um, and if I forget the question, um, I'll just have to ask you again, but you you touched on the idea that, um, not the idea, the fact that we all were in a party bus together. So it wasn't a party bus. It was what they use for people on tour. And um, so it was like a tour bus. We didn't have any trailers because of the limiting budget, which I didn't mind. I think what movie can you say we were all forced to be in the, in the same trailer constantly? And it, it forced us to to bond, to spend time with each other, which is necessary f- when you have to have chemistry with people in a movie, especially when you're acting like, yes, some people can turn it on and off, but the idea that, um, you know, we, when we weren't filming, we were all hanging out in a tour bus and we were just getting to know each other at two, three, four in the morning, um, in the afternoon, figuring out our call times, our schedule. And, and that's why I think the movie turned out the way it did is, is, and for those of you out there, usually actors have separate trailers and they're separated. And um, because of that unique fact that, you know, we were all in, in a combined trailer, so to speak, we got to spend every waking moment together. And I hope that that, you know, translates on screen. And like I was saying, um, when I watch back and I think of all the fun we had, a lot of those great memories are us just talking for hours on end in the tour bus. That being said, um, what was your question? I, I want to make sure I answer that as well. No worries. Uh, just like, what can people look forward to seeing? So this is like horror mo- murder mystery at the same time. So I'm guessing some jump scares, maybe some screams as well. Definitely a lot of screams, definitely a lot of jump scares. I'm not a big horror guy. Um, horror scares me. And I think what I was surprised. So for those of you who aren't big horror film fans, this is the movie for you. Because coming from someone that gets scared easily and gets nervous easily, um, there are a lot of fun. I mean, like I said earlier, it's, it's fun, it's sexy, and yeah, you're going to get scared, but there's something um, just exciting around the corner that sort of brings you back. You, you don't get to, I mean, there are moments where you linger in that fear for a while, but um, you guys can definitely, like I was saying, expect um, uh, a lot of laughs, a lot of scares and a lot of thrills, as cliche as that sounds. <laughs> well, that's a lot to look forward to, and I uh, hopefully a release date or trailer soon prior to the pandemic. I know it was presented to like international buyers, but until then, people can follow at Dreamcatcher, the movie, on Instagram, and Jacob at official Jake Squared, I think is his handle, and I'm sure you'll be sharing news keeping people posted as well. 
I will be. I can't wait. Like I've been saying, I, I think I sometimes have put myself in a situation where I've said things that maybe I'm not allowed to say about a certain project. And um, so like you had mentioned, Check out Jacob's Twitter, Instagram. Um, I don't know his exact handle. I think you said it. I think you were right on the dot. Um, I'm sure I'll announce something hopefully soon once I'm given the green light. And um, I'm really excited for people to see this film because it's a great example. For those of you that are passionate about filmmaking and acting, whatever craft that, that you want to pursue, this is a prime example of a bunch of people coming together with a vision, with a goal, with a passion for what we do and what we want to do and what we love and, and making the best of it. And in my opinion, making a great fun film. And uh, I'm really proud of it. And uh, I hope the world enjoys it and I can't wait for people to see it and let me know what they think. Now, switching gears, let's talk about some of your past projects. It has been 10 years since the release of the first Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie. Looking back, what was your absolute favorite scene to film across the three movies? 10 years. It's crazy to, to process that. Also, I want to shout out your shirt, which I love, by the way. Um, uh, she's wearing a Greg Heffley shirt, um, which is awesome. And going back to your question, I, I, it's hard to pick a particular scene. I think when you do three full movies and I was 11, 12, 13, you just, you're just along for the ride. You don't know what's going on. You're, you're showing up, you're doing your best. And um, I, like I had mentioned about Dreamcatcher, a lot of my favorite moments happen when the camera isn't rolling. But in, in terms of a particular scene, I, there's so many. I think one that I always love from the first movie in particular is when we were filming the Halloween scenes. We were in a big neighborhood I, I, it's funny, I haven't talked about this in so long. It's all coming back to me as I'm, as I'm um, mentioning it. And Robert and I, Robert who plays Rowley, we, I think we were just thrilled to be up past one in the morning. But, you know, we had our costumes on and we were walking in a neighborhood next to a house that apparently was haunted. So in Vancouver, I think it's called the Shaughnessy Mansion. It's been about 10 years. So don't <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. But um, if I, if I, mentioned the wrong name of the house, but I remember we did a tour of the house and they told us we can't go up on the third floor. So like I was saying, it's one of my favorite scenes for the memories that happened outside of, of the filming itself. And just getting sprayed with a fire extinguisher and hanging out with Robert and eating candy in the middle of the night and then going home and doing it all over again. You know, going through a haunted house and then filming and, and just being with your best friend. So it's, that's one of them, but I could go on for hours. I really could. I mean, it, it's such an, inc such a crucial part of my life and who I am and, and such a big blessing. And, and, um, yeah, like I was saying, any, anything that pops into your head too, I'm sure I'd have a story and I could go on and ramble. For yes. Days. I was wishing you were going to say the wizard of Oz auditions, total eclipse of the heart. That whole sequence gets me every time. Uh, just to confirm, was that you singing? No, you know, it, it pains me to say it wasn't <laughs> me singing. Um, I don't even think they asked me, actually, it, which, which hurts. They to this should day have because, asked you because it's really coming from, yeah, a young boy, like 10, 11 years old. I think it sounds great, though. I hope the, I hope the singer who, who, who did voice over me gets credit for that as well. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm, I'm a singer and I'm a songwriter. So now when I look back, I'm like, man, I, I wish I had done that. Not in the sense that it needed to happen, but just in the sense that it would have been nice because music has really become a very important outlet to me, especially during these these weird times, having my guitar and being able to 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 exercise you know my right to work on that craft has been great so um but yeah, that definitely a great scene um the song is obviously a classic <laughs> yes when you're so young you don't realize um you know you just don't understand I think I was learning the lyrics, and I never thought. This, this people are gonna love this scene or, or this song is a <laughs> you're like what song, song is this and then your parents are probably like you don't know this song and now you're like i think you should do a cover of it just just for kicks too <laughs> maybe that would be a great idea um i'm gonna let that i'm gonna let that i think people would love to see that and i think you know obviously i want to make 
the people who've watched the movies happy. So that's definitely something I'm going to think about. That would be great, actually. Great suggestion. So, yeah, on the topic of music, we we're going to chat about that. You know, where did your passion for music come from? Because I think it's especially in the past few years, you've um, started playing guitar and you said writing music. So where did it come from? That's tough for me to pinpoint. I think when I was younger, when I was about two or three, I would sit in front of the TV and I'd dance to music videos. Michael Jackson's Thriller. I mean, for hours. I mean, I can't dance right now. I'm not, I wouldn't say I can. I just, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a dancer. Um, I haven't put in the time that I, I, I could, but I think I always wanted to be an entertainer. So I liked attention. Obviously, I was an actor at a young age, and I still am. And, and I've always appreciated music that makes me feel something, like a good performance. And it got to a point where I, I've sang on, on multiple shows I've done. I did a, a Nick Jr. show called Bubble Guppies for a while when I was younger and before my voice changed and I went through puberty. And I had to sing on that show. And, and I think it wasn't something that I... I felt I needed to do and make a career out of. It was just something I enjoyed, which is where it usually stems from for me. And, and I think about two years ago, I realized that I'd never learned an instrument and I would love to share what I have to say. And maybe there is a lot that I have to say that I don't even know about that if I start learning how to write songs, I could discover. Um, so that being said, Two years ago, I started guitar. I've been writing ever since. And I had my first studio session last Friday. And I, am, I, I played a gig back in early January, all original songs. So you can imagine the crowd was just, we don't know any lyrics, but um, he's got a great voice. And I think the response was overwhelming. And, and that being, to, to go to answer your question, I tend to ramble, I love talking. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't tell you where it, where the passion began. It just, it's something that's, I believe we all have things that we're meant to do. And sometimes the universe just calls on us to say, Hey, you know what? Are you putting in all the time you possibly could? And if you have a gift, maybe I'm not, and obviously we just met, but whatever your gifts are, maybe it's interviewing, maybe it's to hone that craft of becoming the best interviewer and, and personality out there. And, and I think that's how we can make the world a better place. And music is becoming a new calling of mine. And I'm going to keep, you know, I'm not going to second guess it. I'm going to, put my time in and get better and better and hopefully people like what I make so so shout Monster. out to minor chord studio so that's where you've had your session I believe they posted a photo yeah I believe so that's, that's hilarious um yeah yeah um it was just it was pretty rough I, I think to give you a few a little bit of insight on on what that process was I have a guitar teacher I've been working with for the past few years I meet with him every week the type of man he is, is I have to play every single day. And when I'm done practicing, I have to text him that I'm done playing for the day. Because I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that I have to instill these habits. And because I have someone like him, I'm able to just keep going. Otherwise, I'd just probably sit on the couch and I could talk with you for hours and the time would go by and, and I didn't get my, my practice time in. So to go back to Minor Chord, which is the studio I recorded at, I have written a bunch of songs. I don't know which one I want to go with. I want to make sure that my first song and the first few I release are, are, they coincide with the vision that I have for myself as a musician. So that was what that session was. Um, and I think I'm, I'm honing down my top choices, getting people's feedback, and, and then I'm just going to see what happens and see how people respond and, and, and adjust from there. What's inspired you in terms of sound and genre and then in your lyrics, in your writing? Um, it's funny, I've never talked about my music before, so this is all very new and it's, I'm, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. So thank you for asking me these questions. I love talking about music, so um, just never had the opportunity yet. So I think Ed Sheeran has subconsciously been a big influence on me. Clearly he's inspired many people. Coldplay as well. I think it, it just boils down to the artists that I listen to on my own, a band called Bad Sons, phenomenal. Um, the production's wonderful too. So as I'm trying to develop my sound and figure out what I want to say and, and the vision that I have for myself. I'm looking towards people that I can relate to, lyrics I relate to, music I relate to. So Ed Sheeran has played a big part in that because right now I'm an acoustic singer-songwriter. That's primarily the type of music he plays. And I'm starting there. I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. And I think that John Mayer is a huge influence. 
just because I just think that the type of music I'm learning that I write about tends to tends to be, I wouldn't say his guitar skills are incredible. I'm working on getting there. It'll take me a while, but I'm, I'm persistent and I'm optimistic. But I think that as you were saying, the people that, you know, who inspires me, it would have to be those people under an umbrella. And obviously many more, we could talk about the Stevie Wonders, BB King. I think that you have to look at the people that are doing well today and doing well in the sense of people that make me feel a certain way. And, and I admire their talent and their, their work ethic and look at who they um, study from. I think that's the key. And it's just about being influenced by as, as many different kinds of music as I possibly can while I'm growing and learning. Because I could want to make acoustic music today and tomorrow I could be like, you know what? I want to make some rap. And that's what's fun about music is anything goes and I want to enjoy this time before people want me to live up to a, a certain image that I have, which I also don't want. I just want to be real and I want to be authentic and I want people to just know that there's no pedestals and we're all human. And, and I think that's the big issue is like, we all just got to look at each other for who we are and, you know, flaws and, and, and good things and all. So. Yeah. It's always really nice to be genuine in your music. I know you have a couple of highlights on your Instagram, uh, nothing too long. So do you think that you are working on a demo for release like prior to the end of the year? Well, you've really done your homework. You know, it's, it's, it's flattering, you know, to hear you talk about that. So thank you for taking the time to watch that. You know, obviously, well, that clip in particular is a, is a, as a song, one of my songs that I wrote. And, and so when I, I guess I, I'm just thanking you because when I put a piece of my heart out for the world to see, it's nice to see that people are actually taking time out of the day to watch it. So thank you. Um, Wow, I totally lost my thought. Would you mind? <laughs> no worries. Um, a oh, well, demo I mean, prior to the end of the year, are you thinking? <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Um, so yes, it, it's a great goal. I think that is the goal is to have something released by the end of the year, whether that's one song, two songs. Again, it's a whole new industry. I'm an actor. I come from a different world. I think they're similar in a lot of ways, but also different. So I'm learning the tricks of the trade. I'm, I'm respecting the process and I don't want to rush anything. And I want to make sure, yes, I want to put something out there. I also want to make sure it's everything I want to say. I want to feel good about the music I'm putting out there because to me, it's not so much about how things do now. It's the long-term effect. I mean, look at Wimpy Kid. It was popular when it came out, but I think that the, the fan base, and I don't, I don't like saying the word cold following, but the following it's, it's grown throughout the years has been exponential. And I, I would love if my music had that same effect. I mean, the effect that John Mayer has on me on music he released 10 years ago is, is what I want because I think longevity beats instant gratification and the short-term pleasures um, tenfold. So yes, end of year would be great. Will it happen? I think so. I'm working on it, I'm writing, I'm perfecting it. And, and when it happens, it ha I could have the studio session and I could be like, you know what? I want a different sound and I could be like, I'm going to put this there and I'm going to work on something, a different um, song. So I would like that, Chloe. I really would. And I hope that happens. But also, I'm just going to trust that whatever journey I'm on, it's going to end the way it's supposed to and the music will be released when it's released. But again, I keep going back and forth. The goal is before the end of the year. Yeah. And I would like Trust that. the process, right? Exactly. Just yeah. like how you would mention you had tried to reach out to me over the years and we tried to get set the interview up and I didn't even know that. And here we are, you know, a lot of people give up. And I think not because, you know, just the, the, the uh, because of the miscommunication, I never saw your message. I never met you and we were never able to sit down and have this conversation. So that's just a great example of what I want in my music is your persistence inspires me. So I'm going to keep going. And if it works out now, if it works out later, it, it, it'll work out. I know that that's inevitable, you know? And the way it does is whether we're in person interviewing each other or, you know, whether we're on Zoom, it's happening. So that's where you have to trust the universe. I hope I didn't get too philosophical. But, <laughs> Maybe uh, just a little, but there's no harm in that. I wanted to circle back uh, briefly to just chat about your relationship with your Wimpy Kid co-stars. I know in particular, Robert and Devin, you are still close with, you know, to grow up together and still maintain that friendship. I think it's so special, especially in this fast moving industry. You're absolutely right. I think as I've gotten older and 
I say gotten older, I'm, I'm 22 and um, I'm still relatively young, but it's all I know. So I'm just trying to roll with the punches, learn from my, learn from my mistakes. And I think there was a time where we all didn't communicate as much as I now know I, w- I, I would have liked to communicate with them as much as we do now. I hope that was English. Um, but we talk, I talked to Rob, I talked to Robert two days ago. We talk every week. I talked to Devin monthly on average. And you just have a special experience with people. And it's important to continue to foster those relationships. Hold on to those people that love you for you. And when you have that special bond, I don't think I can say that I'll ever meet. I, 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 again, I don't want to say ever, but the bond that Robert, Devin, and I have is, is so unique. The fact that we were all plucked from obscurity in a way, and, and we made a movie that people love and identify with and and let alone the fact that we're we made it together you know that's that's a very powerful thing and i don't think that's something to be taken lightly and taken for granted so as i've found that mindset on the relationships the experiences we all had i've come to appreciate that and i want to put that time in to make sure that we continue to keep that relationship because it's it's really like I was talking about with filming. It's all about the experience for me. And if it's, yeah, there's a beauty in the fact that you all make a film for a certain amount of time and then it's over and it's done. But every so often, you know, a few of those relationships linger on and hopefully they're with you for the rest of your life. And, and that's what life's all about. So I'm lucky and I'm glad to say that we've continued to stay in contact and, you know, we're all human. We all drop off sometimes and we need time to ourselves, but here we are now, 10 years, and that doesn't change the foundation that we've built together. I know you mentioned before that Robert was hoping to come out to uh, California. You're going to hopefully get together. So I'm guessing that hasn't happened quite yet. Unfortunately, no. Obviously, with the virus, yeah, everyone's plans have changed. And I am hopeful that he will come out soon. I know that he's planning to. And when he does... I will be ready, open arms, to give him a big hug and maybe even pick him up from the airport. I was going to say, can he quarantine with you? (laughs) And then you'll get to spend like two whole weeks together. That would be great. I feel like we talk so much that it's like we're already quarantined together. We've been talking since the beginning of quarantine, just weekly, um, if not a few times a week. So I can't wait for him to come out here because like I was saying, the bond that we have is special no one can get in, in between that. And um, we, we're realizing that. And I can't wait till he's out here because now I'll be able to actually see his face rather than talk to him over the phone or, or you know, see him on FaceTime or Zoom. But um, he's a great guy. He's a great human being. And I'm lucky to have him in my life. And I hope that I can meet more people like that as I continue to make music and film and, you know, just navigate my way through, uh, through whatever the heck is going on in the world right now. <laughs> Now, does Zooey Mama ever get tiring for you or maybe you and Robert to hear? Do you ever say it to one another? Or are you kind of like past that stage? It doesn't get annoying. It doesn't get weird. There was a time when it did because when I was 16, 17, and I was a teen and very insecure and wanted to fit in, I didn't want anyone to mention something about Wimpy Kid. I wanted them to look at me as Zach for who I was. But sometimes you have to realize that you know with every i don't want to say every action but the fact that i was fortunate enough to be a part of wimpy kid there's pros and cons that come with that the pros are people are happy around the world and i can't take credit for that i'm just lucky that i was involved in that and that's something to be grateful for and also that means that people are going to see you as that and i think that going back to your question for a, a lot of time for a long time um zooey mama was okay, well, that was five years ago, guys. Like, come on. And now it's like, as you get more comfortable in your own skin and you realize the fact that I even had an experience like that is, is incredible. It's like I hit the lottery, you know? So I'm grateful for it. If someone says Zooey mama to me, heck yeah. You know, I'll say it back to him. Robert and I don't say it to each other, but we'll talk about how crazy it is that we were able to be a part of a franchise. A franchise. I mean, you know, I'm an actor, I'm an artist, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to find new work and figure out who I am. And, and not many actors can say that they were part of a franchise. So it's, it's finding perspective. 
that the Zooey Mama isn't so much about you as a person. It's about a character that, that you know, Robert's character or, or a joke from the movie that people love and resonate with. And if that's bringing joy to people, that's all that matters. So I, I think I would say to my younger self, get, dude, get over yourself, all right? Like, look at the blessing that you've been handed. And, and I'm glad to say that, like the relationships I have with, you know, Robert and Devin, I, I would like to have that same bond with, with the people that, you know, enjoy the films and we can all um, smile together, hopefully. So yeah, um, I, I, as you know, I tend to, <laughs> as you're learning, I tend to go on and I can talk forever. I just, I love to talk and um, especially when you ask such great questions. So thank you. Um, um, so I was going to say you handle child stardom so well, managing to stay both grounded, but active in the industry. Uh, as you were talking about, who are some specific people in your life who have helped you along your journey? I think that, well, first off, thank you for saying that. I think when you're in your own world, you have a different perspective. I'm, I never claim to be perfect. I just think that there are obviously things I wish I'd done differently. And maybe not, maybe going to public school wasn't the best idea. That's what I'm learning because I don't, for a long time, I felt that public school kept me grounded. And I think in a lot of ways, it robbed me of not the curriculum itself, but the people I was around, it, it stunted my creativity because rather than stand out and, and follow the path and stay on the path that, that I was already on of, of being in a very unique position, an incredible position, and then wanting to shy away from that. You know, like I was saying, shying away from the Zooey Mama and shying away from my relationships with the people that um, were very close to me. I think I had the wrong mindset. And that kept me grounded in a lot of ways because I just wanted to stay out of the limelight. I didn't want to be the center of attention. I just wanted to blend in, which I think is a terrible thing when that causes you to dim your light and it causes you to hide who you really are. And that was what I became a victim of, and I don't want to say victim, I wasn't a victim. I, I, I just, the path that I chose at the time while I was navigating that fame was, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be me. If, if being me makes me stand out, I want to be someone else. And I think every teen deals with that. I think as we're growing up and figuring out who we are, and I'm still learning with that um, in different ways. So my parents kept me grounded. Um, I think, again, like I was saying, it's all about who you surround yourself with. And there are a lot of things I wish I had done differently. And there are a lot of things that I'm glad that I did. So I think that I did the best that I could. And now with the lessons that I've learned moving forward, as I navigate a music career and the next chapter of my acting career, hopefully I can pass that on to, to generations if they're willing to listen. You know, they don't have to. They can take what they like and throw away the rest. And, but more importantly, um, the biggest lesson I learned was just realizing that I'm human. And the only reason I was ever in the position that I'm in is because people actually, just like you're taking the time to talk to me and, and, and caring about what I'm saying, it's, I feel that it's my responsibility to do the same to others. And I think when you're in a position of fame, sometimes for myself, I felt that I was, I lost sight of that, that I was becoming an object rather than a human being because I was looking at it the wrong way. I wasn't looking at it that people enjoy the movies. I was looking at it as, oh, people don't see me for who I am. And that's the wrong way to look at it. You know. Um, like I was saying, very few people are put in that position. I was lucky enough to be in it. I did the best I could. And I think, uh, in my own opinion, I think I did well. And, and I tried to stay humble at times. And sometimes it was hard. And I had good people around me, thankfully. And what, to answer your question, I, because, I, man, I just keep going on. People that I looked up to in a lot of ways, Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, granted, he came from a different generation. But um, I think that when you look at the top of, people that are at the top of their game in any, in any um, field, I think that obviously they're doing something that works. So I looked at him. Um, I looked at Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I looked at Andrew Garfield, um, Joaquin Phoenix. I just looked at a lot of different people, actors that I respected, that I admired, and who, tended, who, who were, would stay under the radar and, and do their own thing. So obviously we're all different human beings. That being said, Tangent. I love how I say I just keep going on a tangent. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope the question was answered in there. Yeah, I think basically, like you mentioned, people you look up to in the acting field, um, and then your parents just getting new perspective, which is always helpful uh, to grow in life. Now I want to talk about your amazing fans. Um, 
constantly new fan art being posted on Instagram, accounts dedicated to you. What does it mean to you to have this constant support? Words can't do it justice. Like I was saying, the fact that people take time out of their day consistently to follow me, to like my posts, to comment, I think it's easy to look at a page and go, oh, okay, well, a few hundred people or a thousand people. Well, last week it was 2,000 people or a thousand people. And when your mindset shifts, just in the sense of all of that, I think now that I've started to communicate with the fans and the people that follow me and really get to know them where they're from, a lot of them are from the Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, um, Dubai, the UK, the US. It's fascinating. And, and, and hearing their, you know, how they grew up watching the movies. And it's weird to say that because I, we all grew up together. You know, we're, we, we're, I'm no different than you. So it's like me making a fan page for Leonardo DiCaprio. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of effort. And that just goes to show you what that movie series, how it impacted people and, and how people felt that they could identify with me and my character mainly. So like I was saying, the fact that people spend that time, that is not something to be taken for granted. And I'm now learning that and I'm appreciating that and I'm respecting those people and I'm getting to know them because they want to get to know me and that's only fair. And I want to, it's not because I feel like I have to, I want to, because people that support you, those are the people that, um, I'm not saying like that negativity doesn't matter. I think there's something to be said about good criticism and honest criticism, but those are the people that support you. I mean, I would not be where I am today without whether it's one person or a hundred. And as cliche as it sounds, it's the truth. And I did those movies 10, 10 to seven years ago. And there are still people that are watching them as we speak right now. And that is an honor. And that is a privilege. And I am so grateful for that every day and talking to these people reminds me that I have an obligation to whatever project I'm working on, whether that's music, film, to give it my all. And if not for me, for them, because they're, you know, they're going to support me and I want to make it the best I can for that reason. And like you mentioned, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. And I love that you've actually been interacting with a lot of people who've commented on your posts lately and just checking in with people because that is really needed right now as well. Definitely. I, some of the things I've heard, I, I talked about my grandmother a few weeks ago and people started messaging me. People I've never met are sending me wishes about that. And a lot of people don't have that support. So I think it's, it's fascinating to me that in a lot of ways, I don't like technology because I think we're, we're going so fast and, and the, the line of, of what's right and what's wrong and, and truth versus lies, I think it's be becoming blurred. But the fact that I can put up that picture and talk about my grandmother and mourning, you know, that loss and people opening up to me, people I've never met, like I was saying, all over the world about their experience is not only healing for me, but I hope that it's healing for them. And then we can have a communication. And, and it, again, it takes that idea that I despise, that idea that you put people on a certain pedestal, people that one, don't ask for it. But when you hold people to a certain idea, especially when we're all just human beings and we really are the same, as, as you know, I'm in my living room. I don't know if you're in your living room, you know, like, so I, I think that it's really brought me back down to earth. Not that I was ever, like I was saying, I've been lucky enough to be grounded by my brothers and my parents. But, you know, I, I think just having that extra form of communication with normal people that, you know, are nice enough to support me. It's really just reminded me about what matters in life, you know, and, and like how we can all be in a pandemic. Today, I'm working on something. Tomorrow, we're in a pandemic. And we're all in this together right now, which is a beautiful thing. And I think we're becoming divided. And, you know, there's only, I feel like the way I can deal with that is just put my energy into my music and look at the idea that, look at how much Wimpy Kid impacted people and made people smile. And who's to say that that can't happen in other ways? And who's to say that the people I'm talking to can't do the same? They can, you know? So I know I'm going off, but it's something I'm very passionate about because it's a very new thing for me to open up. I've always felt like I, like I was telling you, I felt like I needed to shy away from all of that. And now that I've embraced it, I'm seeing the light at the, at the, light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a beautiful thing to connect with people. 
And to have that constant dialogue, that's a nice way to kind of close things out before our final question to your signature question. If you could be any ice cream flavor, which would you be and why? Oh my gosh. What a, what a, what a question from left field. Um, did not expect that. If I could be any ice cream flavor, I mean, this is simple. French vanilla is my favorite flavor, not because um, I could use a tan, but because I think it's just, there's something to be said about just something so pure and it's not acting like anything else, but what it says it is. And whoa, that became very philosophical and, and deep, but whoa, that's interesting. Um, and that's how I actually like to live my life and how I want to live my life. And I don't want to say something and, and not live by it. I want my actions to speak for my words and, and um, maybe that's what French vanilla does for me. I've never thought about it until this moment in time, but I just want to be me and I want to um, not have to be afraid to be me. And I want to embrace the goods, the bads and, and, you know, communicate with people and be open and honest. And I know that has nothing to do with ice cream, but because French vanilla is just being, it's unapologetically itself, I would like to be the same. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that's all I have for you, Zach. Thank you for taking the time to chat. Really, really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. I, I want to say, I want to thank you because the, the fact that you want to interview me is an honor, you know, that, that you really prepared for this interview. And, and I, I could see that. And I appreciate that work because um, that goes to show me how much you, uh, you respect your craft and you respect me. And like I was saying is I feel like it's my obligation to do the same for you. So thank you for, for taking the time out of your data. You know, like I was saying, ask me questions about things that I'm excited to talk about, like my music, like Wimpy Kid, like communicating with my fans. It's, it's, it's fun. And I really enjoyed every second of this. And, um, and thank you. Thank you, Chloe. My pleasure. Well, we'll be posting uh, Zachary's social media links below. So stay tuned for his upcoming projects and music. And we will see you next time.